Science is for everyone. Science is for everyone. Science is for everyone. C to S T. C to S T. C to S T. Chicago Council on Science and Technology. C to S T. C to S T. C to S T. Chicago Council on Science and Technology. Science is for everyone. Science is for everyone. Science is for everyone. C to S T. C to S T. C to S T. Chicago Council on Science and Technology. C to S T. C to S T. C to S T. Chicago Council on Science and Technology. Science is for everyone. Science is for everyone. Science is for everyone. C to S T. C to S T. C to S T. Chicago Council on Science and Technology. C to S T. C to S T. C to S T. Chicago Council on Science and Technology. Science is for everyone. Science is for everyone. Science is for everyone. C to S T. C to S T. C to S T. Chicago Council on Science and Technology. C to S T. C to S T. C to S T. Chicago Council on Science and Technology. Science is for everyone. Science is for everyone. Science is for everyone. C to S T. C to S T. C to S T. Chicago Council on Science and Technology. C to S T. C to Good evening and welcome to tonight's program. What is quantum computing? I am Don Lepret and I work at the Chicago Council on Science and Technology in Development and Programming. Tonight's program is presented to you in partnership with partnership with Fermilab. Since 1967, Fermilab has been America's particle physics and accelerator laboratory, working to answer the fundamental questions and enhance our understanding of everything we see around us. The Superconducting Quantum Materials and Systems Center, or SQMS, is a national center for advancing quantum science and technology, bringing together 20 partners, including Fermilab as the host institution in other national and international laboratories, academic institutions, and members of the industry. The Chicago Council on Science, Techno Science and Technology's mission is to inspire and engage all segments of society about science and technology and their contributions. We are thrilled to be entering our 15th year of offering science and technology programs such as tonight's to the public. Little bit of housekeeping. To ask questions, please visit c 2 st 2 dot cnf dot io for q a after the presentation and you can visit c2st.org to learn more about our upcoming programs and to donate to support future programs and now i have the privilege of introducing tonight's positively awesome panel of speakers albeit briefly you can learn more about each of the speakers at c2st 2.cnf.io. 
So first I'd like to introduce Dr. Bianca Giacconi. She is an associate scientist in the physics and sensing area of SQMS, where she works on implementing searches for new particles using SF, SRF cavities. Dr. Ashke Murthy is a research associate in the SQMS division. He works in the area of materials characterization and fabrication of superconducting qubits. Dr. San Posen is a scientist in Fermilab's Applied Physics and Superconducting Technology Division, studying superconducting radio frequency cavities and material science and Dr. David Van Zanten is an associate scientist in the SQMS division. He works on designing and measuring super quantum devices in various architectures. So please remember to ask questions, go to c2st2.cnf.io. And now I am pleased to hand it over to Dr. Van Zanten, who will give you a brief overview of quantum computing before the tour. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, my name is David, and uh, as I said, I'm an associate scientist here at the Fermilab in the SQMS division. Um, and uh, we'll be showing you about what quantum is tonight. Um, so we are not doing this work alone. We are a big collaboration, as was put forward already. And with all the collaborators and all the partners, we're together working on making quantum a quantum computer and quantum hardware for sensing and algorithms. So I think you already know as an enthusiast that a quantum computer is based on something that's called a qubit. And a qubit is different from a normal bit that is used in classical computing by the fact that it is a superposition of zero and a one. And that alone doesn't bring you a quantum computer. That's just a qubit. So to make a quantum computer, you need to connect all these qubits together and what you generate is a complete entangled state connecting all the qubits together. And with that entangled state, you can do some computation. Actually, the idea is that with this, such an entangled state, you can represent with a single state all the possible or uh, all the possible combinations of, for example, complex molecules. And using computations on that state will allow us to characterize molecules or systems or even high energy particle problems. So that's the essence of quantum computing. Uh, the question is, of course, how do we make those qubits? How do we get them together? How do we put them in the tangled state? And that is actually part of our work. And that's what we all try to do in collaboration with industry partners. So a couple of the problems that are interesting for us to solve are related to our energy consumption. There's a bunch of molecules, enzymes, that we can hardly produce without using a lot of energy but using quantum computing, we can calculate molecules that we could produce with less energy. That could save us up to 2% of our global um, um, power consumption. So there's other applications that go towards medicine, where we can make good medicine, better medicine. That's very interesting. But as I said, there's also problems in high energy particle physics that we try to understand from a fundamental point of view. So that concludes about the applications. Um, and then. We want to know, of course, how to make these devices. So this is what we're, what we're trying to show you tonight. And But before we go into that, we just want to show you a little bit on what Fermilab is. So I think we got a great video for you. So let's do this. Start it. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Fermilab. Here we see the iconic Wilson Hall, named after the founding director, Dr. Robert Wilson. This is the atrium view of Wilson Hall. It goes up, um, it's open up into the 15th story. It's a fascinating place to work. And the flags represent the different countries we collaborate with on our different experiments. So this is the main office building of the site. And no one can go to Fermilab without checking out our bison herd. So we do have a herd of bison on site. It was brought there by our founding director, Dr. Robert Wilson. They represent the frontier, as Fermilab is the, at the frontier of scientific discovery. And it's also an acknowledgement of the prairie that originally existed at the Fermilab site. Um, we have a newly installed bison cam that you can check out and check in on our bison herd. So this is the Illinois Accelerator Research Center. 
And it's also home to the SQMS uh, headquarters of the office space and some lab space. And this is the industrial building complex. So you actually see one of Robert Wilson's sculptures out front there. And we're gonna be taking a look inside this building in just a moment to check out the quantum computing lab and the material science lab. And in this um, space, we uh, have facilities dedicated to research and development of different um, superconducting radio frequency cavities, superconducting magnets and quantum technologies. And now we are in the lobby of the space. You see some pictures of equipment, some different um, pictures from visits as we scan around. We also have a display of the different projects um, that the building works on. Um, you can see first the U to E experiment is an experiment about the muons that's being built. We've got um, cryogenic test facilities and of course superconducting on materials. As we walk in, these large cryo modules that you see we're actually building on site to be sent to our sister laboratory, Slack in California. We collaborate with national, other national labs all over the country. We're walking down the hallway. We see some equipment that we're going to be checking out more close up here in just a minute. So this is what it looks like as we're coming into our quantum computing lab. We see some displays here that are related to the dilution refrigerators, I believe, that we're gonna be checking out. And as we walk in, we're just gonna take a quick scan around the space. So down at one end, uh, we'll check out that a little bit later, one of the closed up dilution refrigerators. And if we scan across, we see one that is open. And again, we're gonna take a closer look at that and we're gonna have our experts um, tell you about what we're seeing here. So. Um, Sam and Bianca, we've got a whole bunch of components and equipment out on this table. If you can explain what we're seeing here. Sure. So um, what we're going to show you here is a bunch of components that make up a quantum computer. Uh, first, you can see here these funny sort of elliptical, spherical shaped objects. These are superconducting cavities. Um, they are made of, of a metal called niobium. They're hollow on the inside. Um, and what they are, these are devices that we use to store photons, individual units of light. You can think of these cavities, I, I call them really good boxes. They are essentially boxes for storing light, where the light reflects almost perfectly off the walls. So you can imagine like a pair of mirrors where the light bounces back and forth between the mirrors, back and forth over and over again. And if the mirrors are really, really good, the light could bounce back and forth even to like billions of times. Uh, we use these photons in our cavity, in our box, uh, to store quantum states. We can even store multiple quantum states in a single cavity uh, by using different resonant frequencies of the cavity. We can also manipulate the quantum states by sending in light at other frequencies and even make little interdependencies uh, so that depending on the state of the photons at one frequency, our manipulation will affect photons at a different frequency in a different way. Uh, in this way, the quantum states of our photons become dependent on each other, or as we say in quantum mechanics, they become entangled. Uh, this is kind of like how a computer works, right? Computers have zeros and ones, and they manipulate them in different ways and create interdependencies. Um, but unlike in computers where they especially use electrons, electronics, we have photons. And it turns out that our entangled quantum states can do things that ones and zeros and electronics can't. Okay, what you're seeing right here, this is a chip. Um, you, you can see, well, okay, it looks sort of funny. The chip is sitting on some weird square thing. The square thing is not the chip. The, these are actually two chips. They're the long things that you see on the diagonal there. Um, oh, yes, I even got one here. You can see here it's sitting at the end of this uh, sort of uh, flange, this vacuum flange. And right at the end of this thing here, there's even a little bit of uh, something special. It's actually got some superconductor deposited on the end of it. Um, so this chip is quite a bit different than a normal computer chip. It is made of silicon, uh, but instead of manipulating the silicon in sort of typical ways for a computer, what we do is we deposit superconducting niobium on the silicon, and they even make a special thin oxide barrier between one part of the chip and the other. And this thin barrier allows photons to pass through via quantum tunneling. This process helps to separate photons at different energy levels and lets us set up quantum states in the cavity. Okay, 
Okay, and now you can see that we are walking toward a dilution refrigerator. A dilution refrigerator is a special type of refrigerator that we need in order to achieve super cold temperatures. In order to protect our quantum states, we need to work at a temperature that is very close to the absolute zero. It's like minus 569 Fahrenheit. Uh, why do we need this? Because we need, as I said, we need to protect the quantum states. They are very fragile and even small disturbances can cause the coherence of our states. So um, one big problem that we are worried about is thermal photons that can interact with our uh, quantum states. You, you probably know thermal photons. For example, if you look at a hot stove, you will see uh, thermal photons coming off of it as uh, red light. You normally cannot see thermal photons, but it's, it doesn't mean that they're, they're not there. They're always there. And um, only when we work at the super cold temperature of the dilution refrigerators, we can suppress them as much as possible. In um, um, the dilution refrigerator arrives to millikelvin temperature, which allows us to uh, maintain the states to long enough so that we can have them interact with each other and run calculations on our qubits. We need uh, calculation times of even seconds, which is not trivial at all. It's very hard to achieve such long coherence time. And we need this type of times because imagine if your computer lost all of its memory after a few minutes, obviously it would be uh, extremely hard to do some useful calculation with your computer. So for this reason, we are working to extend the coherence time as much as possible. And it's one of the central mission. So um, you see now that we are working, we are... Um, uh, yep, yeah, yeah, we used some drone footage to give you a full scale view of what this space looks like as we head down to the Material Science Center. Yes. And you're going to see some double doors over on the left side of the screen um, that we're going to be entering momentarily here. And we're going to head down to one of the rooms um, and we're going to have Akshay explain what we are seeing with this cool piece of equipment here. Oh, you're, I think you're muted if you're talking, Akshay. Well, we're looking, yeah, so what we're looking at is this remarkable piece of equipment known as the secondary ion mass spectrometry. So the way that this works is that part of the center, we're really looking and looking to extend the coherence times in these systems. And what we want to do in that case is to really look at the materials and the components that are involved in these processes. So what we do we're using this technique is that this method, this um, instrument is one of the, is remarkable in the sense it's only available in few centers across the world and allows us to probe these samples, the same chips that Sam showed previously with high energy ions and take a look at what sorts of impurities, what sorts of defects, what sorts of inhomogeneities are present in our sample all the way down to a single atom level. And with that information, we can try different techniques in terms of processing in order to improve the performance of these systems further. And to that end, in the material science lab, we have a wide variety of different techniques and methodologies that are available here that I'm more than happy to discuss afterwards. We have techniques here, such as micro microscopes, we have profilometries, and we have other sorts of uh, really exciting equipment that we get to use on a day-to-day -day basis. That's so cool. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so we're going to head out of this space. There's actually three different rooms we're going to check out here. We're going to head down the hallway of the material science lab, and we're going to take a right here on your screen. And again, um, Akshay, if you can tell us about what we're seeing here. Yeah, exactly. So on the very left, we're looking at what's known as an atomic force microscope. So we're zooming in here. What this technique allows is really getting an idea for the actual structure in these samples, looking at the topography. So if you look at something like a map, and you notice any sorts of bumps or in the undulations, those are things that you can actually detect on our sample using this methodology. 
further, it's connected to this cryostat here. So these techniques can actually be done at very low temperatures. On the right side, we have what's known as a PPMS or a property, um, physical property measurement system. And this allows us to get the electronic properties of these structures as well, all the way down to extraordinarily low temperatures. And now we're gonna head out and we actually um, are going to head to the electron microscope that I still remember seeing when I was an intern at the lab and I was so excited. Like this was 10 years ago and it blew my mind. And we have someone working in here who is gracious enough to let us join him and see what he's working on. So again, Akshay, if you wanna talk about this a little bit. Yeah. I mean, an electron microscope is always exciting, right? Because it's one of the most, it's basically like you have an optical microscope, but it's significantly more powerful, allows you to actually look at the structure of your sample all the way down to the nanoscale. And that's what we're looking at exactly right here. And a really neat capability of our system is that it's actually connected to a cryostat in that it allows our cooling of our sample down to extraordinarily low temperatures. And here we have a really nice zoom in image of what we're looking at. So we basically place the sample on the stage, we're able to cool it down to temperatures on the order of a significantly, significantly below room temperature and actually see how the structure changes over time with this really, really powerful microscope that we have access to. And across the street in that IARC building, we have what's called the assembly, heavy assembly building. And we have like a giant dilution refrigerator here. And it's also really scary to stand at the edge and film this. I'm just going to say that like it's very, it's very far down. Um, you don't necessarily get that scale in a virtual tour. But so it's a giant dilution fridge. And I don't know if anyone has anything they wanted to share that they didn't get a chance to or wants to talk about this a little bit. Yeah, this is being converted to a dilution refrigerator. It's not there yet, but oh, okay. uh, <laughs> this is uh, uh, has been used previously for testing magnets for a particle physics experiment. And uh, we are being very good in recycling um, this piece of equipment to uh, make it uh, into new, exciting quantum science for us. Yeah, you can see sort of a little bit of this is actually, by the way, where uh, some very awesome particle physics was done. There used to be a big detector here for the Tevatron, and right in this very cave. And so uh, this has a lot of uh, uh, science history here. Yeah, resp responsible for discovering the top fork in 1995. Yes. Well said. So. And various other random particles. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Most exciting. <laughs> And so that um, wraps up our virtual tour. Um, so you can learn a little bit about the stuff that we're doing in the quantum computing lab and material science lab. And Dawn, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. That's my fault. Did we want to hear from each of the speakers a bit about what, what they do specifically or did we wanna jump into questions? Yeah. Yep, we can hear from our speakers. Um, Akshay, if you want to go first. Yeah, of course. So hi, everyone. As I mentioned, I really look at the materials aspect of these systems. So I'm a material scientist by trade, and that involves, um, on a day-to-day -day basis, taking a look at the superconducting qubit samples that we have and performing analysis using a wide variety of different materials characterization techniques that we showed here. So this is all done in an effort in order to understand all the way down to the atomic and nanoscale level, what is giving rise to decoherence in these systems. And by that, what I mean is we want to be able to store the information in this, in this quantum state for a longer period of time. So we need to identify what it is within these, within these systems that is preventing that? What is it that's causing the information to be lost over time? Bianca, do you want to go next? <laughs> sure. Um, so I'm a physicist. I did my bachelor and master uh, in physics at the University of Milan in Italy. And then during my master, I came here to Fermilab for a summer internship, and I really like this place. So I decided to then do my PhD here um, in Chicago with the Illinois Institute of Technology. And I was working, I was doing my research at Fermilab, working on SRF cavities. Now that I finished my PhD, I'm a scientist in SQMS, where I work in the physics and sensing process. So 
in the physics and sensing, we don't work directly on the quantum computer, but we combine the, our goal is to combine the quantum technology that is being developed for the quantum computer with SRF cavities in order to implement searches that can be, for, for example, for new particles. So we're looking at the moment for axions, uh, dark photons, dark matter candidates, but we, um, we also can use a SRAP cavity as detector for other type of physics. For example, the, we can do condensed matter experiments. Uh, it's very a very versatile uh, type of searches. And Sam, do you want to go next? Sure. So um, I uh, have two roles at the lab. One is that I am uh, part of an organization where we work on particle accelerator technology. So we work on improving the superconducting cavities uh, to, to make uh, particle accelerators more compact and more efficient, and thereby make new scientific applications based on particle accelerators even uh, uh, better, have a more scientific reach. And the other role that I have is also, like Bianca, in uh, physics and sensing, searching for dark matter, searching for gravitational waves. Uh, you know, we, we run these cavities, things like this in, in different regimes. One is uh, with uh, tons of photons in order to accelerate particles. The other is with like single photons and trying to search for uh, new physics. So I get to play with both ends of the spectrum. And David. Hi. Yeah, uh, so I'm David. Um, I'm working at the devices and um, co-design group. Um, so the device is pretty straightforward. Uh, what I do is that I design the devices. Uh, so what I mean with the design uh, devices, that's actually the integrated combination of that little silicon chip, this little silicon bar that you just saw, what goes actually on it, how do we wanna make that, that oxide barrier between the different elements of that little little piece of electronics that sits at the, at the end, but also the design of the cavity and like, what well, the questions that I try to answer is, what are the different parameters that we need to use? What are the different parameters that we need to use for the cavities, for the device, what is optimum? Uh, we try to simulate um, most of it so that we can make a good estimation what the experiment is gonna bring. And then finally, we ask our foundries and our manufacturers to make the, di the different constituents of, these, uh, of this integrated system. And then finally, we get it together here at the lab. We put it together in a dilution refrigerator, and then we got to measure it. So that's essentially um, th that is a yeah that's a part of the design part. And then there's a co-design aspect to it that this uh, actually this device sits in a bigger picture where in the end we need to do algorithm uh, algorithms. So we want to discuss with theoreticians well what algorithms we can can actually execute on this kind of technolo technology. Um, what is feasible? What can we do in the near future? What we can do in the uh, far future? What is the what are the steps that we need to do? And that combined with also the room temperature electronics, which need to be state of the art, uh, needs to have some kind of capacity capabilities. So we're trying to design and decide what what is that capability uh, that we need from room temperature electronics. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm working for. We're going to jump into some questions. And one of the questions here is for you, Bianca. What is quantum sensing and what are its applications? So, when we talk about quantum sensing, it means that we are looking at signals that are, for example, single photons. So, in cavities where these uh, cavities that Sam was showing, they were developed for accelerators. So, usually, these cavities are operated with something like 10 to the 25 photons inside of them. But for these uh, dark matter searches that we're working on, obviously we don't expect dark matter to create such a strong signal. We are, look, we are expecting uh, dark matter to create a few photon signal. And this is how we combine quant, uh, quantum technology with a SRF cavity. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Another question is, who gets credit for quantum computing and how long has it been around? And I think that question was posed to you, David. Um, yeah, that's hard to say, hard to answer, to be honest. Um, this, the idea of quantum computing has been around for roughly 30 to 40 years, I think. 
Um, it kind of started out with a sort of um, conjecture of, no, not a conjecture, sort of fantasy of uh, a, a, a very famous and very established professor, Richard Feynman. Um, he he thought about, he was very, he was very enthusiastic about computing. Like he was a physicist, um, a professor, but he was also very, very interested in computing and, and just the, the foundations of computing. So he wanted, he started to think about how quantum computing could be used to actually solve quantum problems. So from that point, uh, he, he fought that for a long time, I think close to a decade, until we basically at a conference uh, gave uh, like discussed these ideas of using quantum mechanics for quantum computing. So I wouldn't say that it all goes to him, but I think he's uh, he can be appointed as one of the yeah maybe founding fathers or at least uh, somebody who conceptually contributed a lot. Okay, thank you, thank you for that question, and I think since it's quite relevant at the moment, one of the questions and it's posed to you, Sam. Are there scientists working behind you? Oh, uh, yes. There are, uh, uh, you know, we, ha we have a lot of here. We have scientists, we have engineers, we have technicians. It takes, you know, it takes a, a whole bunch of people to make this work, right? Experts in all kinds of different systems. Uh, the two people here are uh, masters of their craft. Uh, this is Eve and, and Daniil. They are setting up. Oh, hey, guys. Say hi. <laughs> They're living actually. <laughs> <laughs> they are. They are um, preparing an experiment for uh, later this week, I think. So um, they're uh, uh, preparing the the dilution refrigerator. I mean, we have to put the stuff in it and then close it up, pump out all the air, and then start cooling it down. Uh, and it's it's sort of a process, right? You need to make sure that all your sensors are connected correctly, that all of your things are working, because it takes a while to cool it down. You don't want to. You know, get it all the way cold and realize that you forgot your wrench inside or something like that. So you, or you forgot to connect your cable or something. So um, they're they're preparing the experiment, doing a lot of checks, and uh, uh, we we are uh, excited. We're doing a lot of really exciting stuff these days. So I'm sure it will be very uh, cool science. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, I laugh just because we joked a little bit about that before the program began, and sure enough. Um, our viewers were curious. Um, are the and this is a general question. I don't have a specific um, person. Are the light capture boxes and other material science lab equipment designed and made at Fermi? Thank you. Like uh, like these cavities. The light. This is. I, I think this is what we're we're talking about with the light capture boxes. Actually, Bianca, yeah, you, I think you, it's you can you can answer this question. <laughs> So these cavities are designed at Fermi of Gas, and we have multiple types of cavities, like, for example, these two, this is so small. <laughs> or, or that one. The, yeah, exactly. And then we have very big. <laughs> this one is a multi-cell cavity. And then, for example, no, I will go with this one. <laughs> so we have different geometries. Uh, so these cavities are designed at Fermilab. Usually they're not built at Fermilab. Um, we send the... So here at Fermilab we do a rough design, mechanical design, then the cavity often is built outside. There are a couple of uh, companies that build them. Okay, and... So very... Um, big, I'll say precise process. Yeah, uh, just... Just to express a little bit about the precision on this process, um, the frequency, the, the, the feature that you're looking for, the resonance frequencies, they are typically a thousand, no, a million times smaller than the, the, the value itself. So you're looking for, so you really want to know very well where to expect the frequency, because otherwise you have to search for a very, like in a very broad range for a needle in a haystack. And that takes a lot of time. So the better you know the frequency up front, the better it is. Now the frequency, as it is very small, like as the the, the um, as the signal is very small, spans over a small frequency range. Um, any dent in the cavity, for example, or any irregularity at the wall of the cavity will shift the frequency immediately by several orders, and that makes that you have to search for your needle and a stack. So you want to do this very precise, very controlled. 
Um, that makes sense. You were talking about working at the nanometer and even, you know, when we get small, can you imagine? Goodness. What is the approximate timeline? I don't know. I'm not sure if that's even a fair question, but from the idea of like, here's our concept, we've designed it. How long would it take to fabricate and then test it? So for cavity, uh, we are talking probably a few weeks or months to do the design, to do the complete design of the cavity, and then probably six months to one year to actually uh, get the cavity, to, to build the cavity and receive it, and then you start testing. So it's not a fast process. Oh, goodness, no. You get this great idea, and then you have to wait several months to experiment. So I'll say, but also like we can take the cavities that we have and treat them in different ways. So if we want a new cavity that's a new shape, you know, something where we're trying to do something uh, very dedicated and special, like like some of the experiments that Bianca does for, for uh, physics and sensing, really need some very special shaped cavities. But if we want to do some like uh, new uh, experiment to try to make our cavities more efficient, to make the quantum states last longer, something like that. We have facilities here where we can treat the cavities so we can heat them in different ways or deposit something on the surface and those those facilities we have here and these cavities can be treated many many times and so we can try lots of different things and when we try these things we want to know what's going on on the surface and you know akshay can talk about uh, maybe the timeline for doing like a material stuff okay yes yeah so, I mean, it really depends on the different techniques, but some of these techniques you can perform over a course of a day. Other times you have things that take multiple days. In terms of one of the things that we like to do is the rating is the back to the top, the SIMS instruments. This is a very remarkable instrument we looked at at the beginning. This involves radiating the sample with high energy ions and taking a look at what impurities, what defects, and what uh, sort of inhomogeneities are present in our sample. For some of these samples, we want to actually take a depth profile and get this information throughout the entire um, throughout the entire thickness of the film. And this can take in the order of days and if not um, a week or so in order to get the full information. But in generally, it really depends on the sorts of the um, the level of information that we're trying to get from the sample. Um, together, this I think the entire center is sort of built in uh, in terms of timeline, and it's really built on the course of five years or so in order to get to where we are in terms of having prototyped uh, quantum computers to get to the point where we have um, something that's scalable and something useful for industrial level. Okay, thank you, thank you. We have another question climbing up the charts in popularity. Could anyone on the panel discuss the news story about the Boston weight discovery at Fermilab? Any potential effect on quantum computing? Thank you. Fascinating and accessible presentation. Appreciated. So the what weight discovery? The Boston weight discovery at Fermilab. B O S O N Boston. Boson. 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 Oh goodness gracious! Oh, yeah. I apologize. <laughs> okay. Um, you know anything about the boson? It, this is like a little bit it, far field from us. It's yeah, it, I think it just came out from the CDF experiment. Yeah, I think so. My parents actually sent you this. Oh, good. Okay, <laughs> so you're an expert. I think it's pretty far from our field. Uh, what they were saying is that they analyzed, they just analyzed the results, they got the mass of the W boson, and it's 10 times different right it's yeah it's different from the what they were expecting so now they need to understand uh, if uh, they need to extend the current model what's going on i would argue i would argue that it doesn't really impact our our work currently what i can imagine is that this is typically some of these things that you might want to run a, use a quantum computer for to to figure out if how how you can explain that right so maybe there's an algorithm maybe the, an, a high energy particle physicist can devise an algorithm that is currently just too complicated to execute on a classical computer so maybe you can do it on a quantum computer and so yeah that that's typically these things yeah. high like high energy particle algorithm physics algorithms that if you want to yeah that you want to execute on a quantum computer if, if I, can, okay. I can give a very quick general comment which is that we love it when we don't understand things. That's our favorite. And um, you know, the the standard model of particle physics has been an incredibly successful model, and and so many predictions have matched the model. But then we get kind of uh, frustrated because there are questions that we still have 
that the model doesn't answer. And so whenever we find something that's inconsistent with the model, we get really excited and we say, oh, maybe there's something here that can answer these questions that we don't understand yet. So um, the, the fact that it's inconsistent is a good thing for us. We, we get really happy about that. Yeah, and if I can just jump in, I think in order to get to that point where you see like new particles, you get new information, you really you need these extraordinarily, um, sorry, the extraordinarily powerful accelerators, extraordinarily high quality things. And that's, that's the thing that Sam was talking about earlier in terms of having these light boxes or whatnot that makes ex extraordinarily high quality. So the same technology that we're using in quantum computing can lead to these high, uh, high quality accelerators that can then provide information on things like dark matter, which Sam and Bianca are also working on. Thank you. Thank you. I think that lends very nicely into another question, which is how far are we from a quantum laptop? <laughs> um, I would argue a million miles away or, or maybe <laughs> maybe further. Um, just to give you some ideas. So typically we cool down our uh, quantum devices in a cryo set like this. So around this, we'll, you will have shields right, that will allow us to pump everything down to vacuum. And then we are going to cool the system down to minus 200, oh, uh, minus 270 degrees. I don't know what that's in Fahrenheit. 169 Fahrenheit. <laughs> so very, very cold. So I think that's about uh, 50 millik above the absolute zero in the universe. So uh, that is very cool. For that, you need a lot of power. Actually, something about 15 kilowatt hours, uh, 15 kilowatt. So that's not something that you want to have in your own home, right? You don't want to run your laptop on 15 kilowatts. But that will be terrible. So I wouldn't, from any perspective, not recommend anybody to buy a quantum laptop. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the PSA. But if um, I could just jump in for a second, that doesn't mean all hope is lost because a lot of these things can be, per and you can sort of think of this sort of dilution refrigerator as a server where now you can actually be able to access it through your, through your laptop through various like a cloud computing scheme. So you can actually be running the quantum computer on your own laptop without having all the hardware present location that's the source of platforms that we're trying to look forward to in the next uh, within the next decade oh i see thank you thank you for sharing that um i think this is a question posed towards each of you what is the hardest thing about your work and what makes you excited to go into the lab we can start with you david <laughs> The hardest part of my work right now that I really have to get used to is the fact that it takes about a year to get a cavity. That is something that I'm not used to. I'm, I did my PhD in a different kind of field where I could get my, like, where I wouldn't need to plan so far ahead. So I could say that that is the thing that I have to get used to most. Um, then what, what makes me excited to go into the lab is just what makes me excited to do science in general, which is the discovery part of it, right? The, the fact, the anticipation of actually seeing something that you are working towards uh, for a while, that anticipation is just, um, it, it is really, uh, really, really nice. I'm going to add on a bit because I know that we're curious. Have you always been interested in science? I think you should ask my mother that, but I think I am. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I think uh, I've heard stories that I was, uh, I used to be very interested into science already a long time ago. Yeah. Any influences that you can point to? Not really, no. Okay. Okay. Thank you. How about you, Sam? What's um, the hardest thing about your work? What's the hardest thing about my work? Uh, um, I think sometimes. I think I'm close to um, <laughs> let me think. Uh, so it can be frustrating that things can take a long time. Um, and, but I don't know. I, I actually, I like all the weird things about my work. Like even the challenges I find fun. Like sometimes it's hard to plan in advance. Sometimes it's hard to, uh, uh, sometimes you do an experiment and you get something completely different than what you're expecting. And that can be frustrating. But, you know, if, if, uh, if it were easy, somebody would have done it a long time ago. So sort of take that too. I'm, I'm having a hard time answering that question. But I will say that uh, 
what gets me out of uh, bed in the morning is I love to uh, do hands-on science. I love to like have you know clear complex systems and get my hands on them and you know put something together or uh, you know have a, a an experiment where I get to turn knobs and flick levers and and uh, type in data. I guess I, I love that part of it. Um, and in terms of how I got here, I have always been technical systems. I thought when I uh, went to uh, undergrad that I was going to work on airplanes and helicopters and this type of thing. And then I started taking courses and I really enjoyed the physics ones. I really enjoyed, you know, I, I got to take sort of a general first year in my undergrad uh, in, in, in engineering physics. And uh, I got to learn about lasers and quantum mechanics and particle physics. And I was like, this is awesome. I want to do more of this. And then I took a bunch, I did some, some internships, some summer internships. And that was so, so, so important. Um, if you take anything, if I can give you any advice to the, the people out there who haven't yet decided what they want to do is go try things. There are programs to uh, go and do research, uh, you know, if you're an undergraduate or something like that. And you can find out what you like. You can find out what you don't like, which is also super important. You get experience. Um, you get stuff to put in your resume. You make contacts. Like, it's all super important. Uh, and so... I found out that I really liked big science. I found out that I didn't like certain types of science. I tried uh, plasma physics. It wasn't for me. I didn't want to work on fusion energy. Um, and uh, that, you know, led to, uh, into applying for grad schools. And I think that they looked at my application and said, oh, look, this guy has done some research things before. And so I think that was very helpful. Uh, so apply for, for programs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bianca? So, what's hardest? What's hardest? I think being an experimentalist, uh, as Sam was saying, things don't always go as you wish in the experiment. Uh, there is always something that goes wrong, something that breaks, uh, something that you had not, not thought about. So, that can be frustrating. But on the other hand, it's also the exciting part that every day you need to improve, uh, you repeat the experiment. Uh, uh, you always try to optimize the system, what you're studying. Um, so it's both what is frustrating and what is exciting. And uh, working here, there is so much expertise. Every day you can learn something new. There is a new instrument that you need to work on and you can uh, learn about. Uh, um, and you're always exposed to people with different backgrounds. So there is uh, always a uh, learn. And regarding how did I get into science, uh, I actually, so in Italy, the education system is a little bit different. So in high school, you need to choose which type of uh, like uh, subject you want to choose. And uh, I chose the classical high school where like we don't study pretty much any physics, any mathematics. And I quickly understood that it was not for me, actually. So when I finished high school, I decided to enroll in physics, and it was super hard because I had no math skills. Um, I barely studied any physics in high school, so it was very hard. But um, I knew that is what I wanted to do, and um, I, I kept on that uh, road. Thank you. Thank you. Ashke? Yeah, so I think I'll, I'll go off what a lot of others have said and that the most challenging part is just, at least for me, is the fact that we work on the front frontier of research. We work on the frontier of these qubits. And for me, it's a puzzle every day, right? So we have these chips, we have what the performance metrics are, and it's a puzzle into figuring out how do we improve them further? What is causing limits in performance? What is it on the atomic nanoscale that's causing this? And I just have access to a wide variety of different tools, and it's a puzzle to figure out what it is. And it can be frustrating. It can be extraordinarily irritating to not be able to know the answer, um, but also extraordinarily fun at the same time. In terms of the best part of the job and what I love about it is just being able to work with all these phenomenal experts and folks that we have today presenting, um, people who have wide uh, backgrounds in terms of being in condensed matter physics, being in theoretical physics, being experimentalists. Um, it's really, it really goes across the entire spectrum. And it's really 
cool in the, in the sense that just by talking to them, I learn things new every day. And I love that aspect of it. In terms of how I got here, I mean, I think I've just always been interested in physics, always been interested in chemistry, just loved, um, I mean, it's the idea of atom, being able to see atoms, electrons, that stuff has always been extremely fascinating to me. And um, through college, we've explored a lot of different areas, got really into the area of computing. Um, and that was through undergraduate and graduate studies. And here I am in terms of applying what I've learned, applying my expertise in order to solve a critical problem. So yeah, it's kind of all here. Well, thank you. Um, I really like the kind of trend I'm hearing in that there's a lot of collaboration in the work that you do. Um, so thank you for that. Um, another popular question is, what is the relationship between Fermilab and Argon Lab? Can we answer that? Sure, I can answer that. Um, Fermilab and Argon are sister laboratories. I mean, it's it's sort of uncommon in the lab system for uh, there. There are seventeen DOE labs across the country, and it's uncommon for them to be so close together. And so we have. Uh, it, you know, we collaborate with Argon in several areas. We're a little bit different than Argon because we're pretty focused on uh, specific areas of, of research, um, especially high energy physics and, and, you know, now quantum is another big thing for us. But Argon does like everything, you know, they've got chemistry, they do like batteries and, and just all kinds of, you know, interesting x-ray science um, in addition to the kind of work that we do. Um, and so, but we, we collaborate with them in, in, in specific key areas. We actually have a joint processing facility where, where cavities will go um, uh, sometimes to Argon, sometimes here um, in order to get uh, treated and, and uh, assembled for testing. Ah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, another question, how does quantum computer or how does your quantum computer compare to the one from IBM or Google? <laughs> yeah, so I can take that. Yes, um, I, think, the best. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think we're all dealing with the same challenges in terms of we're on the in terms of the information that we're able to store. It's really on the order of microseconds. So microsecond is one thousandth of a millisecond. Milliseconds, of course, are one thousandth of a second. But we're really targeting, and IBM's targeting, Google's targeting, is we're trying to get to that millisecond, or we're trying to get to that second time scale. So we're really all in that same sort of ballpark and trying to make revolutionary uh, improvements in order to get to that point. But um, I think. It's an exciting time to be in this field because uh, it's it's so clear what we need to do, and there's just a number of different techniques and methodologies in order to get there. Okay. Um, I would like to add maybe perhaps something. There's just there's two things that we're pursuing in SQMS. So there's one type of technology that we're pursuing, which is very similar to IBM uh, IBM's technology, in which you basically take one of those small devices at, that is on that silicon chip. And that small device is engineered in such a way that you only use two quantum levels to do your computing. And then you replicate that system many, many, many times. So that's referring to the, how many qubits do you have in your quantum computer. We at SQMS, we are also pursuing another way of quantum computing, which is essentially instead of just using two levels, we're using as many levels as we possibly can. And that is allowed by the fact that these cavities here have a lifetime that is of the order of a second. So we are, we, because that coherence time in that cavity is very long, we can actually use way more levels than just the single, the, only the lowest two. So this is a system that is called a QDIT. And with a QDIT, you can store as much information as, this is an equation, I'm sorry, of log to n qubits. So that means that a single cavity or a single cavity mode, actually single frequency in the cavity can host equivalent of many, many qubits. So these are two different technologies and we are pursuing them side by side. And it is unknown which one will function best. And perhaps even some algorithms are more suitable for a qubit type of computer similar to IBM's. And some algorithms might turn out to be more suitable for a qubit kind of computer. I love okay. this because it's like, what if somebody at the beginning of classical you know, said, okay, zero and one is great, but what about zero, one and two? <laughs> You know, it's, it's like if they, it's, you know, before binary was established, somebody thought, oh, let's let's make another thing. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you. I think this question might kind of relate to that. Um, if quantum states cannot be observed without being changed, how are they useful in storing information? Great question. You leave that to me. I, unless you want me to talk. <laughs> so, so there's two ways. There's two ways how you can talk about being destroyed. So when you do a measurement on a quantum state, uh, you are indeed perturbing the quantum state. You are enforcing it to, to take a call, actually to, yeah, how, to how do you press? Uh, to, to collapse the wave function. Yeah, well, the, the, technical, the technical term is indeed to collapse the wave function or, um, you know, just to, yeah, you have to, the quantum state has to pick one of its, one of its basis states. So for example, for a qubit, that will be zero or one. So it is not the problem that you cannot do with anything with that. What you need to do is that you first need to create your state and then do your, essentially do your operations on it and then measure the system and that will generate one answer. Now you do this many, 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 many times and that will build up a picture on the properties of your system, right? So it is not a sense, in a sense, it is not that you are that you do measurements during the computation or during your algorithm, you do always do the measurement after the algorithm. Now we can go into details about error correction, but I think that will bring us way too, too far. Um, so there's another way how, and that's more detrimental, how you can measure a quantum state. And that's not by asking the system in what, of, what states it are, that is actually by demolishing the state, by taking away its energy. And that is a more complicated problem. So. These two ways of measuring we call quantum demolition. That's the last one and quantum non-demolition. So in the quantum non-demolition one, the one that I discussed, discussed at first, you're actually not destroying the quantum state. You are basically asking the system to take sides. Does that answer it correctly? That's a great answer. Okay. Yeah. Oh, gosh, I'm flashing back to PCAM when I learned you couldn't tell where an electron was and how fast it was going at the same time. And I was like, wow, that makes sense. Thank you. Ask it what you were, were you going to add something? No, I mean, I think David uh, did, did a phenomenal job, so I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Oh, gosh, we have so many great questions and we're running out of time. Um, I think the question I'll ask here is, is there a reason why the cavities are mostly rounded? Yes. Yes, there is a reason and it comes from the accelerator world. This uh, shape is called the Tesla shape cavity and it was optimized for accelerator in order to reduce some phenomena like multipacting where we are, where we start emitting electrons from the cavity surface and they uh, impact on the wall. Every time they impact, they cause emission of new electrons and they keep the, uh, bouncing between walls around the cavities and they can disrupt the performance of the cavity. So this shape was optimized in order to, limit, to uh, decrease some of these physical phenomena that can limit the performance of the cavities. Ah, and I'm sure it took quite a bit of trial and error to get to that being the optimal shape. Um, okay. Has Fermilab opened for public tours? Yes. Yes. Come see the bio. <laughs> Beautiful. And how can interested university students learn more about this type of work? This is not a question for any of the four of us. It's for Amanda. I think. <laughs> Where do we go to learn more, Amanda? So for university students, um, so the resources that are on the C2SD website um, pointing to the SKMS um, information, there's postings about internships. Um, internships typically, uh, those applications I want to say open around in December. It's internships.fnal.gov. Um, you know, look at those. You can look at job postings every now and then. There's openings for summer students to do some more technical work. Um, you know, there's, you know, and reach out like, you know, if you, you have a university professor that's kind of working in this area, you know, we partner with lots of universities on various things, go and talk to them. If this is something you're interested in, don't be afraid to knock on their door and say, hey, I want to learn more about what you're working on. Um, you know, what what can I do? What can I help with? Um, you know, they're always eager to, in my experience, to talk about the work they're doing, get some help. And um, you just never know. Just, I mean, ask. And attending programs like these, um, watch our websites to learn more about the content that we have available. 
and yeah, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to send, you know, emails, things like that. There's lots of different ways to get involved. And I think going back to what Sam said, you know, and I already mentioned internships, like try out things, learn about what you like, learn about what you don't like. This is a really exciting field. We just wrapped up a session of Saturday morning physics that's for high school students. And, you know, the uh, la our lab director, uh, Nigel Lockyer said, you know, this is an exciting time to get in if you're getting into college, getting into this um, quantum science, quantum sensing, quantum computing field, because it's just getting ready to take off. Thank you. Thank you so much. And at the risk of running over by a minute, I love this question. I'll ask you each very quickly. If you weren't a scientist, what career do you think you would have chosen? What do you think, Sam? If you weren't a scientist, what would you have done? Um, you know, I might have gone into building planes and, and helicopters. I almost did. Um, it's it's a they're very cool systems. I love complex stuff. Thank you, thank you, David. I really wouldn't know um, if I wouldn't if I had to choose something else. Might have been medicine, but I never crossed my mind to be honest. Okay, okay, Bianca. Uh, I when I finished high school, actually, I wanted physics, and at the same time, I wanted to go to school of. Uh, uh, metal smith to know how to like make uh, uh, jewels out of uh, oh, gold and silver, but in the end I found out that I couldn't do both because the metal smith school was actually a real school, so I went for physics. So I guess if I wasn't a physicist, I would have done the other. Good for us. Aske, what would you have done? Well, if I couldn't get into physics, I couldn't do chemistry, well then I'll do math. So the only thing almost as cool as <laughs> science is I'm uh, getting to Matt, so that, that's my answer. And I hope uh, hope we convinced you that all of us are very into science. And uh, thank you all for joining us. I think you have. I definitely have. And thank you all. We need to wrap it up. Thank you to all our viewers for joining us this evening. And thank you to Bianca and Aske and Sam and David and Amanda for your expertise and your enthusiasm in breaking down the complexities of quantum computing and sharing with us SQMS. Um, you can join us next week in person on October, excuse me, April 14th at Alulu in Pilsen for our first speakeasy program since 2020. The program's going to explore how we can use sunlight to kill germs with Fulbright, Fulbright scholar, Dr. Nimai Pathak. And if you've missed any portion of this program or just want to rewatch it, please visit C2ST TV on YouTube. And you can evaluate tonight's session at c2st2.cnf.io. You can also sign up for C2ST's weekly newsletters to stay up to date on what's happening in STEM or support more programs like this one at c2st.org. And finally, this is Dawn from C2ST. Thank you for sticking around to the end of the video. We hope you learned something new and now comes the most important part. Please like this video and subscribe to our channel if you enjoyed what you viewed this evening. And you can even hit that bell icon to be notified when new videos are uploaded. And if you really, really like us, leave a comment below. Thank you everyone for watching, stay safe.